Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Blade Runner San Diego Comic-Con at Home panel. I'm your host, Jason DeMarco, co-creator of Toonami and development executive on Blade Runner Black Lotus. I'm happy to say I'm joined here by several of the creators and makers of that series. And we'll start with Shinji Aramaki, co-director, Kenji Kamiyama, the co-director, Joseph Cho, the executive producer, Wes Gleason, the voice director, and the very talented Jessica Henwick, who plays the voice of our main character, Elle. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Great uh, to be here. We, Thank you for having us. We have been on a very long journey to get here, uh, about five years, I think it is, from, from when we first started talking about this to now. So I personally am really happy that we're at a point where we're about to be able to start talking about this show and why it was made and talk to you guys about, about your inspirations behind sort of how you approach the work and talk about that we're going to be putting it out fairly soon this year. Um, so all that said, I think, why don't we just go ahead and, and get right into it if that works for everybody. Um, Great. I think, I, I think the first question to ask is <laughs> how did this project come together? Um, Joseph, if you want to take this and then sort of, um, I'd love to hear from Kamiyama and Aramaki about how the project came together as well. I think this project actually goes way back to, it's interesting because, you know, that Jessica is here with us because uh, I think I mentioned the her when we were recording. Um, you know, I, I worked on uh, the project called The Anime Matrix, which was the anime version of Matrix. Um, Classic. Um, way back when, yeah. And then, um, um, and Jessica happens to be um, starring in Matrix 4, of the upcoming Matrix 4. <laughs> You know, it, it's all circles, you know, it, it all yeah. connects. Um, and uh, after that project ended, I think I was looking uh, to, you know, I was really thinking about what might be an appropriate project to adapt like that. And, um, um, and you know, always the answer was Blade Runner. Because, you know, Blade Runner itself actually inspired um, a lot of anime, like basically a lot of cyberpunk anime look and feel and, you know, all that visual um, actually were in, inspired by that. And I think um, Ghost in the Shell was, you know, also influenced by that to an extent. So it sort of went around in a circle. Mm -hmm. So why not go back to the source? But, you know, I did not know how um, the rights were uh, being handled at the time. And, and but, um, you know, I started, you know, chasing it from that point on, even after I went independent. Um, and it took me, it's like almost like 15 years. Um, and, uh, and finally the rights, um, were, uh, uh, with Alcon and then we were able to do a, uh, um, short as they were preparing for a sequel to Blade Runner called Blade Runner 2049. So, uh, I, I did a short with, uh, our creative producer on this project, uh, Shinichiro Watanabe, who's also a director of the Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo. And uh, he directed the short uh, as one of the promotional piece um, for 20, uh, Blade Runner 2049. And um, that sort of connected to having a conversation with you, Jason, uh, about, uh, you know, being interested in um, exploring yeah. this as a series. And so um, that led me to start having conversation uh, with, you, you know, my partner directors, uh, you know, um, Kamiyama-san and also Aramaki-san. And, um, and yeah, and yeah, five years later, here we are, um, you know, doing the panel with Jessica and Wes. <laughs> I think I'd love to ask a little bit about what was the process of getting Kamiyama and Aramaki to come on board and what did they think they wanted to bring to Blade Runner? Like in terms of, we all know what Blade Runner is. We're all familiar with the original. And of course the great sequel that I think is pretty much just as good as the original hugely influential work in the case of their first movie and and everybody it, it's certainly in the world of anime it's influenced so much so what did Kamiyama and Aramaki how did you get them on board and what did they want to bring to the table um, as we were as they were working on a our our um, concurrently ongoing project called uh, Ghost in the Shell. I mean, he also worked on the previous Ghost in the Shell series as well. Uh, both directors were on the project when I brought it up to them for for him and also for Aramaki san They basically grew up in this movie, so just hearing this was yeah, well, that's unbe unbelievable. We can actually make that with our own hands. That's great. When do we start? Is is the reaction that he had? Um, it's one of the actually the you know first films. It was one of those movies that he caught in theaters. 
And it was actually a short duration uh, that was only showing in Japan back then, but then he happened to catch it. And all his career, he's been, cha- you know, that whole visual shock that he received, that he's been chasing that to try to realize what he saw and the impact that it had on him. You know, when it was first offered, he couldn't believe um, that he could actually now do it with his own hands. But at the same time, there's so many things that he wanted to do that it was very hard to decide what to do, <laughs> or how to choose, you know, what, you know, um, because there's so many things that, you know, you could do with it. And uh, and to try to even be part of the pro- you know the, this whole franchise, um, so for him it was almost like a kid in the candy store um, uh, type of situation. Yeah. So I have a question. I just want to take it to Jessica for a minute. I, we're all old men, so we grew <laughs> up with this movie. You're not old, so my question is, how did you first hear about Blade Runner? What was your original exposure? And what was your thought when this came to you as a role? I don't remember how old I was when I watched it, but it was definitely one of the first sci-fi films that I saw. My dad is a huge Blade Runner fan. And um, yeah, I watched it and I remember being pretty blown away, actually. And uh, yeah, like Joseph mentioned, so many things are derived from Blade Runner and it was only then that I started to go, oh my gosh, so many things that I thought were original were actually rips of Blade Runner. <laughs> uh, so when the, produ- when the production reached out to me, I mean, of course, I, I, I jumped at the chance. I, I never thought I would get to be a part of uh, the, the, this world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was- well, I thank your father for being a Blade Runner nerd <laughs> on behalf of all of us Blade Runner nerds. Um, He's done good. Um, <laughs> so I, I, we haven't told many people, we haven't released much about where the show takes place within the Blade Runner universe in terms of timeline, what the general story is in the broadest terms. Joseph, do you want to ask the director sort of where in the Blade Runner universe does this show take place and l- talk a little bit about what the main concern of the story is? What's the like what's happening in our show. As, as far as timeline goes, the series actually falls uh, in between an event called Blackout um, after the first movie. I think uh, we touched on this in the, the short uh, the short that we did with uh, Watanabe uh, Shinichiro. And, uh, and um, that basically concerns the worldwide blackout event um, where you know, the world has lost much of power and the, and the, and the memory, you know, that were stored in um, servers around the world so that um, there's a massive loss of communications and things like that. That Between that and the chaos that starts from it, in 2049, which is the, the, where the sequel film has happened, so the series falls just around in between. Uh, we're thinking maybe 2032, but uh, we were lucky because uh, a 2033 sounds much better. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so, so the original film, the original film was 2019. Uh, yeah. Now we would say an alternate timeline of 2019. Yeah, yeah. blackout uh, happened in 2022. So yeah, so this about is 20 years after the blackout. 10 years after the blackout, and then uh-huh. before um, 2049. So that's around uh, about 15 years prior um, to uh, to the the events of the sequel film. Yeah. And so, so yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Joseph. The series we're trying to anchor it um, from the perspective of a uh, of a of a of the the one that's hunted, uh, you know, replicant, um, but also a, a female hero um, who who happens to be just trapped in this world and just trying to find that figure out and find out um, you know the identity and the reason for the situation that she's in, uh, and that's that's what the main story uh, uh, is 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 about. Yeah. You know, he doesn't want to spoil anything, so um, he'd like you to edit him out um, if, he, if he said something that's uh, not supposed to be said. Yeah, so I think, obviously, I mean, it concerns itself with a female replicant. Uh, in the, um, but, um, okay, what's the larger context of it is the, 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 the world. I mean, who's running that world? Um, there's, there was a Tyrell Corporation in the first movie, and there's a Wallace Corporation in the in the final, uh, the second movie. Um, so, what happened in between, and what's the what's the intrigue? Uh, what's the world that uh, that's really, you know? I mean, we often feel like I guess we're kind of part of the, this big machine, and so I, I think uh, you know we're trying to address that mystery or question 
what happened and how it happened um, between the films. Yeah. So I know that Wallace Jr. is a is a major character in the series, um, and we actually meet Wallace Sr. and see the dynamic between him and his father, which I think is an interesting new wrinkle, especially if you've seen 2049. Um, in terms of the themes of the show, um, you know, broadly, I would say the themes of Blade Runner, going back to the Philip K. Dick novel, are very anti-capitalist. It's about the destruction of, you know, how corporations basically destroyed the world. Uh, poor people live on Earth and people who have money don't. And people who have money have replicants to do their dirty work and people who don't have money have to do it themselves. So in terms of those themes, how do the how do the directors see those themes threaded through this show? Does it follow sort of the same through line of the pessimistic Blade Runner anti-capitalist universe or uh, are they putting a different spin on it or are they diving deeper into it? Like what was their looking at Blade Runner and that point of view, that pessimistic point of view, how did they want to approach that? Kamiyama san says, you know, yes, the world itself is, you know, uh, the, the world that we live in, in in Blade Runner is, you know, very dystopian. And, um, you know, it obviously is a very anti capitalist in town. Um, but, you know, I think where the series is, even that capitalism itself has collapsed. Um, and and, and it's, 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 ha- it's made life uh, more difficult um, for the people. And, and so, um, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the whole thematic exploration, you know, of the series it is, you know, somewhat reflective of um, what might be going on right now uh, with the, you know, um, the world has few, faced huge difficulties and um, and it's it's fallen into a place where, um, you know, there's such divide in a society and, and there's a struggle, um, you know, of the main character, you know, in it. I mean, basically the people, it's, it's, uh, people are struggling in it, but uh, I think the, 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 but one different thing that he actually wanted to kind of um, portray like or focus on um, a little different from the film was the uh, struggle on the part of the individual, um, um, you know, how, you know, the individual versus the society, the indi- individual, you know, um, against the world. Um, yeah, how, how do you, you know, how do you stand and, and really, you know, um, find your own um, identity and a, a place in a world, in, in a world like this? And so, um, you know, because the, you know, the series actually, you know, um, explores the character, uh, the female hero, who is actually facing, um, uh, you know, the world in, from the perspective of the replicant, because the previous couple of films were from the perspective of Blade Runner. Really, this is from the, uh, the point of, you know, uh, the, uh, from the point of view of someone who's being hunted. And someone, you know, um, who's on that side of the world, you know, it explores the, the, the themes of obviously it will touch on because of that, you know, the themes of this, you know, discrimination, um, alienation, um, um, you know, just just in general, you know, fighting against the injustice. And so all of those themes are in it. And, and um, but, uh, you know, for for him, really, the focus, you know, on, uh, you know, for this series, he wanted to be he wanted to be on the individual. Uh, it is a very dystopian um, type of world that you know that, that, that these people live in. But also, he um, wanted to you know through the events that that's happening in the series. Wanted to also talk about like um, you know a hope. He doesn't want to spoil anything, but uh, you know, so you know, uh, two people come together. Um, you know that there, you know that there, that there's there could be love and there there could be hope, um, and that they could stand together. And the the drama, that drama also, um, you know, not just some cold, difficult, um, you know, uh, you know, uncaring world, uh, but even within that, you can find it. Um, and and I think he wants he wanted to also talk about that thread. And uh, another point that Kamima Asangi uh, wanted to um, touch on was. It is also has a same character with uh, it shares a, the series shares a character with uh, the twenty four uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Um, you understand that there's a character named uh, Neander Wallace Jr. Uh, and um, and it's it's about a god complex, right? 
um, a man who would become God. Um, uh, you know, it's it's almost like the world that's almost you know that, that lost the ability to procreate. Um, here's the here's the person who just comes and then hey, or I can save you. Um, and and we would often see that with I think uh, with um, or dictators or corporate overlords and whatnot. There's some savior complex or God complex. Millionaires, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? You know, and and how 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 does one become that or go through? You know, uh, and and. It also, it's, and so for him, it was an interesting theme to deal with. I mean, especially with Corona going, uh, you know, Corona pandemic happening, um, you know, um, all at the same time with the production. So it was something that also resonated with him as he was working on. Yeah. Well, I think that that actually brings up a great point. You know, Corona did heavily impact everybody on this panel approach to this work. I'd love to know first from Kamiyama and Aramaki, uh, what was it like making this show during... A pandemic. Corona Animation itself is, you know, uh, production process happens through, you know, lots of discussions and meetings and um, just to human interaction. But, but however, you know, animation, even compared to, for example, live action film, um, we don't have physical sets and it really happens in a, um, in a, in a digital world. So, um, I mean, in theory, it's not that tough to switch over to uh, a, 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 a remote work and, and work through computers. Um, but the problem was, you know, it's that human interaction part where, um, you know, to try to convey the, the kind of um, changes or that, or kind of um, acting or the kind of look that he's, uh, you know, that they're looking for. It's, you know, it's very hard to convey for some reason through this cold medium of the digital um, um, uh, technology. And uh, and so there are a lot of misunderstandings sometimes, you know, of the, of the intent that was, you know, that, 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 that he was trying to, um, um, you know, get, get the staff to understand. Um, so it, it, it was, that was probably the toughest part for him. Yeah, but you know, we got around to it, but um, but it was very tough for him to get you know, adapt to. Yeah. Yeah. Aramaki, you got it. Another tough part. Um, it was also the process of um, a recording. Um, and um, and um, the reason being, um, normally this type of cross border productions. I mean, we would head over to America to um, try to be in the, you know, in the, in the middle of recording. And, and, and with Wes, I think we, and, and, and Jessica, we did a couple of sessions that, you know, that were there. So at least we got to try to, we got to do that in the beginning, but, um, but once the pandemic happened, um, everything just switched to remote. And then, you know, we had to figure out a way to try to um, get that done right. Um, basically relying on you know, relying on the, 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 the team, team at the studio, ADL studio around the world, um, relying on Wes and relying on you know um, great you know actors like um, Jessica. But what that what that also did was um, you know for Japan time it's like odd ends and odd hours you know <laughs> and so it'll be like um, two a.m. four a.m. Um, six a.m. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so wherever Jessica is, you know, it's like, hey, we got to record her. She's in London. Yeah, okay, three a.m. I got it. <laughs> so, so, so that was a that was tough because uh, it continued for a while. Um, that's hard. That's not just Jessica's fault. Come on, like we can't just throw her into the bus. Jessica's fault. No, it was my fault. I felt so bad. I felt so bad. <laughs> Every session would start with an apology, just like. Uh, Good morning, guys, or good evening. I'm so sorry. And uh, Jessica, we know that it's now 1 a.m. for them right now. Just disclosure, you know, disclaimer. Yeah. It was, it was, it was actually, you know, maybe it was better for you guys because, you know, then I, I just basically almost dosed through a few, th- few of those things, so I didn't get to say anything. So it's like, oh. Uh-huh. Well, you were uh, lucky. Oh, Joseph, you were lucky. very good. You got to, you got to the camera. <laughs> Producer can doze. Director can No, just... <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, 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 I but he also thinks, I mean, the reason it also, it was, you know, we were able to, you know, get through with this is because, you know, you know, the first recordings with all the, all the main actors uh, and also with Wes happened before the pandemic. So we did have a physical contact prior and then so we got to meet in person. So it helped, um, you know, rather than just cold meeting in digital and then try to do it, um, uh, you know, and some, 
you know, because some actors literally, I mean, like Brian Cox and, you know, some of these wonderful actors, I mean, um, that we couldn't believe that, you know, joined the show, just literally recorded from their closet. So, so, so. Hey, voice acting, baby. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's, a, that's actually a great segue because I want to hear from Wes and then Jessica about sort of the process of casting the show and how you approached, not just during COVID, but just how you approached the casting period, Wes, for this show and how, how easy was it to line people up? And, you know, did you have to convince people it was worth returning to this world again? What was your sort of process? Well, segueing back to, you know, working under the pandemic, I, for one, was very grateful uh, for the chance to meet Aramaki-san and Kamiyama-san and Joseph and the whole production team with Alcon prior to our pandemic, because I think as the directors were mentioning and Joseph, too, that that collaborative process, being together, the energies of feeding off each other, I think is so essential to the kind of work that we all do uh, in our own given fields. And you know, uh, very grateful initially approached, you know, by Alcon Television Group to be a part of this. And, uh, you know, upon meeting with them, uh, they then wanted me to meet with the directors and Joseph and, you know, sort of discuss, you know, their thoughts. And, you know, they were quick to ask my opinions on, you know, these characters and what I thought just after reading, you know, a few scripts and, and seeing sort of the Bible that they had formatted uh, series outline. And, uh, you know, from there, it was... It was very, I think, um, you know, uh, a coherent, communicative process, despite the language barrier. And I always felt so grateful for them just being open to my ideas, as well as just trying to understand where they were coming from. And I felt those journeys, you know, usually didn't take very long because we were often on the same page, you know, on the same uh, line of thinking. Um, you know, and the executives at Alcon, you know, are very, very proud, you know, and I think uh, uh, excited about this franchise and, you know, the, the ownership of that, you know, property wanted to make sure that this was going to be right in line with 2049 and with the original and everything in between from the blackout short 2022 or 2022 and the other shorts that were released with 2049. So Andrew Kosov, you know, uh, Broderick Johnson, they were very much involved once we got to discuss the casting. Um, and that was all sort of a process that happened after initial just conversations about, you know, creative visions for each character, for the themes in general. Um, you know, and from there, there was really... Uh, it was it was short short lists for some of these major roles, mm -hmm. and Jessica was a standout with our group. You know, for for this unique role of Elle, as as the team has said, you know, this is going to yeah, be no question, right? Yeah, there was no question. You know, as long as Jessica would say yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was just, so you surprised. Can you can pay me later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was so, I was so surprised when I got that email. I was like, really? They want me? <laughs> well, I think that's a good question. So, Wes, what 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 made you guys think of Jessica? I mean, I agree, Jessica is perfect for the role and totally killed it. So, what was your like? Wh what role did you see her in that you thought that's L? That's going to work. It's funny you say that. I mean, I definitely was familiar with a lot of Jessica's work, anything from Game of Thrones to Iron Fist and, you know, knowing some voiceover work that was yet to be released uh, was also sort of in process. And uh, hearing, you know, her range, I think both as an actress and vocally speaking, mm -hmm. we knew this character needed to really have this transition throughout the, the series to where it was going to start, you know, from a fresh, vulnerable place almost youthful, you know, almost innocent, you know, in a way, and then progressing to something very different, you know, very, very much letting the experiences throughout the series kind of form who this person is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, back to the decisions to cast her from the executives at, you know, Alcon to the whole team, to our directors, to Joseph, you know, it, it was Jessica, you know, by and by far just for being able to capture, I think, all those range that we were hoping for. And, you know, Eugene Song, I want to give him such credit as the writer of this series, you know, really crafting, I think, a chance to see the the growth from the replicants point of view, as Joseph was talking about. And, you know, I feel like the theme of this series um, is about, you know, identity 
and sort of humanity as a whole. You know, we see so many of the humans in this series kind of portrayed in these negative lights, you know, that you could, you could blame circumstance or the environment, the dystopian sort of uh, oppression and everything that goes with that. But I think, you know, by and large, you start to see that it's their choices, you know, and, and despite experience, despite exposure, it's the choices we make that really make us who we are. And I feel replicant or human, you know, those choices are clear in the way that Eugene crafted these stories and the way that directors, you know, had that growth, had the chance to sort of show this change, this, this becoming, you know, a person through their experiences. And, you know, that, that's a lot to encompass in, you know, a, a short amount of time, uh, even as, as fast as this series move and is sort of, um, you know, I think also slowly it moves at time, right? Like it really has that Blade Runner feel to me where yeah. it lets the scenes breathe. And, you know, we kind of hear these characters uh, in their natural spaces. And I know that was really important to the team from the beginning, you know, recording the dialogue first. So I think credit to all these actors uh, on board, you know, Joseph mentioned Jessica and Brian Cox, you know, from West Bentley to Will Young Lee, you know, and all these actors like bring their own flavors and their own interpretation. And I think it's all imagination early to where we're just off this script that's crafted and, you know, the directors have a vision and, you know, I might have a take on it. The actors have a take. And then it's that collaborative process to find it initially. Uh, and that's just all, you know, usually the actors are alone in the room reading with me. And, you know, I, I wish I could prov provide a space for them to all work together, but that's just kind of how voiceover goes. Yeah. And uh, again, just credit to them that they, they really lock in on that natural feel that I think the team was looking for. Um, the dynamics of sort of staying in the space of these characters in that natural way and, and finding unique choices that, you know, bring about the humanity, bring about the sort of special sides of these characters, uh, especially replicant or human. Um, yeah, just that's uh, good. I mean, did you write that down next to camera, dude? <laughs> oh no, I mean, but really, from the pandemic, I think after we got from uh, you know those initial records to all the imaginative stuff that uh, <laughs> just has got out. I mean, you know, like I, I love the process because I feel like so much of that is in the actors, you know, uh, court right for those initial records. We're just going off imagination. We're just going off of what I'm describing or what they see in the stage direction. But so much of that is just wild and kind of on their own with trust in mind. And then once we get to the ADR, you know, that's a whole different process where we're showing them a little of what they did, you know, and then in the pandemic, that was all remote from, you know, multiple time zones to studios, to multiple closets uh, all around the world, uh, you know, making someone like Brian Cox uh, sound like he's strangling someone in the midst of his closet. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna make the poor guy fall out in the closet. Yeah, yeah, or or have have Jessica go crazy because I think I think she was drunk that day. No, was, was <laughs> that was the best day ever. <laughs> you, the day that like... I realized how much fun it is to play someone yeah. who's just like got no filter, and that's the interesting thing and really what attracted me to the role is, um, I mean, Elle wakes up and she doesn't know who she is or how she got to where she is, and all she has for a clue is this tattoo. And so she's experiencing everything for the first time. What, what does it feel like to fall in love for the first time? What does it feel like to feel rage and fury and joy? And, uh, and yeah, asking all these big questions of what does it mean to be human? Um, how do we define humanity between uh, a replicant and a human? Uh, yeah. What's the difference? So what was it like seeing the very first you know, animatics and stuff, you, you know, when you were like, okay, this is, what's the show going to look like in your head? And then you got the grayscale blocky character sliding. What was like, what was your process? Like, how am I going to get into the head of this character? <laughs> I mean, I think when they initially emailed me, they did send me some character art. And so I, I think I, I saw the bandaid and I was like, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> it's so cute. I have to do it. Uh, but yeah, no, it's interesting because you come in and you read, you read the scripts and it's completely blank. There's no art yet. And then getting to see it slowly rendered more and more and more is amazing. And, and uh, all respect to the artists putting in the hours. It's, it's, it looks so good. <laughs> and the budget looks so high. It's unlike any 
anime I've seen before, and I'm and I'm a huge anime fan. So I think it. So that's a good that's a good question that I want to pull a thread on too. I think the show did come out looking amazing. Jessica, I wanted to just ask you. Yeah, you have also done voiceover for other anime. Um, and, you know, looking at your IMDb, there's a whole lot of what we would call nerd shit on there. So is that <laughs> like your personal, you know, are you gravitating towards these roles or are these roles coming to you or are you not worrying about it? It's unintentional. <laughs> no, it's unintentional. But when I got this, I did tell, <laughs> I did tell my brothers and they were just like, well, you've, you've hit the trifecta, you know, that what other properties can you touch? And so it's now kind of a running joke that what other properties can I touch? Um, <laughs> but no, it's completely unintentional. I love, I'm a big fan of genre. I consume sci-fi and fantasy a lot. I read a lot of fantasy books. I watch a lot of sci-fi films. So it's definitely what projects I'm attracted to. But um, yeah, they do seem to be coming a lot. Well, I mean, we're happy to have you and, uh, you know, it's not like it's not working out, <laughs> but I think, so I think, you know, you spoke of the look, Jessica, and I think I'd love to throw it back to Kamiyama and Aramaki, you know, uh, I agree. The show does look amazing. Um, I think it's actually the best CG looking anime I've ever seen. Jason calls me like almost every other night. It's like, you know, this better come out looking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> or you're done with us. That was, that was my number one note. I mean, I did feel like if you're going to approach the world of Blade Runner, it needs to visually be sumptuous because all of the, both of the Blade Runner films and Blackout 2022 are all visually sumptuous. That's part of the world is a character unto itself, which is what uh, uh, Aramaki and Kamiyama have said to me several times. So I think the question I wanted to ask is, Joseph, when, when you three knew you wanted to do this in CG, what first of all, what made you decide to do it in CG and not 2D like you did with 2022? And second, when you did decide to get into the making this world in CG, how hard was it and what were the biggest challenges in recreating the Blade Runner world, which was mostly models and sets, even on 2049? Right. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just start, uh, you know, from my perspective. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Blade Runner set a certain, I mean, amazing standard in terms of look. I mean, it's a look that didn't exist before when it came out. And and um, um, and it, it really influenced the whole generation of a a anime filmmakers. Um, and um, when we did Blackout, uh, you know, uh, with Alcon, um, it's a blessing, um, with, um, you know, Watanabe Shinichiro, he... You know, when we did that short in 2D, I, I mean, you know, I have to say the era right now, we um, we got the best um, animators, you know, um, at the time. I, I mean, that exists right now. Like, you know, you know, pretty much all congregating into that short. Uh, and and this day and age, it's, it's just very, very difficult to get these kinds of veterans uh, all in the same place to, you know, to do even, uh, to do something like that. And I think short, because it was also, it was possible because it was Blade Runner and it was because of short, um, you know, the level of the talent that we got at the time. I mean, because all of, all of them have gone on to the, you know, you know, all of them are famous names, but all of them have also gone on to become directors on their own, you know, of their, you know, their own. And I mean, they're already established and for them to come in and play a part, um, you know, you don't have to be Blade Runner and you have to be in a short form. Um, so, you know, it was very, you know, it was a very scary prospect when we heard it's a, a series, you know, because um, I mean, you know, you know, and, and I really, you know, I really understood, though, when 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 Jason was telling me, look, this has to look great. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, I understand. So what is it? What do we do now? Um, and. You know, computer graphics is um, is at a level where we can also try and um, um, uh, and somehow emulate or, or pay homage to the kind of lighting that happened in the, in the film and the kind of the look and feel and and the movements and the, and the atmosphere. Um, so we felt like that um, that would be the uh, that would be a one possible way to go. Um, so rather than try to repeat that repeat what we did in the in the short into a series format. So I think that's. Um, that was the challenge at hand. And then the reason to decide to go to CG was because of that. It, it, it can close, it can more closely approximate 
the the the, the visual of the film, um, um, you know, in, in a format that we're in. Um, so I think that that's why the choice was made. So from his perspective, I mean, um, you know, the Blade Runner itself um, is, you know, the, the city itself, in the Blade Runner, the city itself is actually a character as well. Um, so the environment is, is a character. Um, and the difficult part about trying to do that in, um, in, in 2D is because, you know, you're going to have to then draw every single one of them and then, and then try to make that, uh, make that city come alive. And, and there's, there's a limitation to that. Um, so to try to really portray and try to really pay homage to the, the visual aesthetic of the film, um, CG, uh, you know, uh, might have, you know, for him at the time, it would seem like a better choice. And it, it um, you know, it was, it's not as if the CG wasn't tough either, but, uh, but at least it'll enable us to try to show the city and then and then also do the type of lighting that's important because it's a very dark environment um but it's lit in a very interesting way and um and and with cg you can almost you know approach it intuitively so um in a way that it, you know they they thought that okay it might be a better medium to try and do this uh you know via cg and also you know to say um but that also goes you know we you know to a you know, we need to give a prop to our um, CG supervisor, um, Manny. Manny, uh, actually, you know, he knew how to like this. And, uh, and um, um, he, you, know, you know, in a way, our CG supervisor was our director of photography in a live action film. So how to light it, how to set, set up the sets and, and, and you know, uh, um, so basically the overall how the screen should be made, how, how, the, how the picture should be made, like that, that whole, and it all comes from, you know, um, his sensibility and the crew. Uh, and, and it's something, um, Kamiyama-san thinks it might be a little difficult for from a purely Japanese artist um, 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 uh, perspective, um, because, you know, we, you know, they think, in, you know, if you go approach from a 2D anime artist perspective, its world that's flat and 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 the lighting itself is not something that's that's focused upon. Uh, so having that international perspective of an international crew, we actually have a crew that's like United Nations. Actually, I mean, they come from all over the world in Japan um, to try and do this. And and really, it's uh, it's it's the you know really we got to give the props to Manny and the crew to uh, you know to create this kind of visual. Yeah. All props to them. Yeah. Well, we are, we're, we're short on time, so let's go ahead and get Aramaki's point of view, and then we have a few final things to wrap up with, Joseph. All right. Okay. Aramaki, how you know, I think he kind of sh shares the point of view of uh, Kamiyama-san, but, uh, you know, that if you try and do, do it in 2D, you know, when you, they start focusing on the light first and then try to, okay, what's dark? But when you do it from CG, what, can, what you can do is start from dark and then you figure out how to light it, you know, where to light it. Um, and, and, and that's an important thing to do. But, you know, there's almost like in, in that sense, it's, you know, there's really no other choice than, um, you know, very, it's very ideal for uh, to, to, you know, to do it in um, CG animation. You know, uh, you know, the type of neon signs and how it's neon lit city and this and that. Um, and, um, um, and also, for example, the, the, the characters, um, you know, we actually had a very many, many false starts trying to get a look of the film, right? Um, but initially, you know, we had outlines to the characters. But eventually what we did was we did it away. Because, you know, when you try to make it look like anime, you put an outline um, and, and, um, and then try to, you know, manifest it that way. But we got rid of that and, um, and then make it, you know, basically blend into the environment because the city itself is the character, you know, as, as Kamiyama-san pointed out. Um, and, but, you know, I also have to say, um, that, you know, I mean, Alcon was gracious enough to actually invite us to, when we were doing the short, um, Kamiyama-san couldn't go because he was finishing up the film, but, uh, Aramaki-san and Watanabe-san, and we went to, uh, the set of the 2049 and got to meet with, you know, Roger Deakins, you know, who's you know, a great, you know, Legend. great, you know, uh, uh, director of photography. And I think that's, you know, where we kind of took away, I mean, what we took away was, yeah, it's all about the lighting it's all about how the picture is composed and and so yeah in a way i think i mean and and then you know in just trying to do an honor you know just just pay homage to that you know we were just trying many different looks and it was getting scary but 
Um, but uh, with Manny, I think we found that look, and you know, and I, I really, I really hope that um, that their audience really finds it. I mean, the fans really find it, um, doing it, you know, somewhat of a justice to the, the original source materials. Yeah, me too. And I, I will say, I think you guys nailed it. And I was one of the biggest people worrying about it. I, <laughs> yeah, you know. I was very skeptical, <laughs> uh, but I believed in you, and I believed in Aramaki and Kamiyama, and thankfully, that belief was not let down. Um, thank you for to everybody for being here. Um, we are going to take a look at the key art, uh, which is the first key art we're releasing today for the show. So this is the first sort of poster we're putting out um, that people are going to see. You guys want to go ahead and throw that up, production folks? There it is. I don't know if you guys can. You guys can't see it. From the screen. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I think awesome. it's really cool. It's from the same folks uh, that did the open for the show. Yeah. And uh, Aramaki and Kamiyama gave invaluable assistance on the design. It's all about L um, and Black Lotus. Um, so. Yeah. That's our opening song. Can we mention that? Or is that a, is that a spoiler? No, no, no. Yeah, we can mention the opening song. Um, <laughs> Alessia Cara does the opening song and it's terrific. We're going to share that with people a little bit later. Um, I'm supposed to mention the show. We're, we're not gonna tell you the exact release date yet, but it's fall of this year. Um, and following this panel, which we're about to wrap up, we're gonna show you the first trailer for the show. So hopefully you like it and share it with people. Um, I just wanna say before we go and go to that trailer, I just wanna thank Joseph, Shinji, Kenji, Wes, and Jessica. Thank you all for coming to the panel and thank you all for your amazing work on the show. You're all artists who made the show something special, and I really hope people agree. Um, so thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks for watching the panel, and let's take a look at the trailer for Blade Runner Black Lotus. Everything intended will happen. This little light I found Take it in and breathe it out Where am I? A little drum that's beating loud Don't forget me In my chest I hear the Bang. sound You lost? Leave me alone! <laughs> I can feel did I do these things? I can feel if I were you, I'd walk away from this whole thing. I can't do that. I can feel you now. There are ways you have to do things if you want them to happen. Need to borrow this. Down, eliminate Black Lotus. Blade Runner Black Lotus coming this fall. Only on Adult Swim and Crunchyroll.